last group which is to have um, Joe Nelson's group, uh, TA uh, Rob Castellano. Um, so we have, uh, they're speaking about uh, wave dynamics of one spaces. Um, hello, my name is Leonardo, and this is it, my mom is Lily, and unfortunately, Joe and Rob are at conferences, so they couldn't be here, but we're gonna thank them in advance. Um, so this summer we worked with, um, we worked on a project and we titled it Web Dynamics of Lens Spaces. So I'm just gonna give a little spoiler on how to construct a lens space, because it's going to be useful later, and I'll leave the construction up on the board. Right here, it's a pop up. So lens spaces, are quotients of S3 by ZP actions. So, so more precisely, let P and Q be co-prime and uh, find the action uh, given by this matrix. So we're defining the action of this on, on S3, and this makes sense because S3 is in C2. And so, and so the quotient of, of this action on S3 is going to be called the lens space LPQ. And I'm just going to leave this here because it will be useful for Eric to use later. So now that we have this, so let's talk about some motivation for this talk, uh, for this project. Um, so lens spaces are something that we'll define later called contact manifolds, and contact manifolds are objects in contact geometry. And why do we care about contact geometry? Contact geometry is sort of the odd dimensional analog of symplectic geometry, and symplectic geometry has been around for hundreds of years. It's uh, it's sort of the natural environment to study classical mechanics and string theory. So, and the Hamiltonian vector field in, in physics is sort of the analog of a red vector field, which we'll define later. And so why do we care about lens spaces? These lens spaces are the simplest examples of closed orientable three manifolds. And they, they're the first Type of three manifolds that have not that are not entirely described by um, their fundamental group and homotopy. There's actually L51 and L52 are not uh, homeomorphic, but they do have isomorphic fundamental groups. So lens spaces are just really nice uh, objects to study. So now that we have some motivation, let's talk about some background we'll be using throughout the talk. An n-dimensional manifold is a topological space that looks locally like Rn. I'm going to go through this really fast because so everyone here knows this. Um, the tangent space um, is just a, an n-dimensional vector space at each point spanned by the tangent vectors at that point. And a one-form is a linear function on the tangent space. So now that we have some basic background and know what a differentiable manifold is, we can talk about what a contact manifold is. And a contact manifold is a differentiable manifold with a contact structure. And a contact structure is a maximally non-integrable hyperplane distribution. And assuming you guys don't know what these words mean right off the bat, uh, I'll explain them uh, a little bit better now. So what a contact distribution, what you, have, what you should have in mind is Hyperplanes of each tangent space such that these hyperplanes do not make the tangent bundle of a smaller manifold. So it's much better if I have a picture. So what are hyperplanes of the tangent spaces of R3? They're planes. So at each point we have a plane here. And when I mean that these can't make the tangent bundle of some smaller manifold, if we try to glue these things together, we obviously need to rip it down the middle. So now that we have some idea of what a contact structure is, let's try to think about how we can find them. So if alpha is a one form on a manifold such that alpha wedge the alpha to the n minus one is a volume form, then the kernel of this is going to be a contact structure. 
And we call one forms that satisfy the, this condition uh, a contact form. And in our case of our three here, we have alpha is dz plus x dy. And we can easily compute that alpha wedge d alpha is dx wedge dy wedge dz, which is the volume form on R3. So the kernel of this is the contact structure that we see in this picture. So let's do another example. Um, we know that odd dimensional spheres can be embedded in R2n, which can be identified with Cn with these coordinates. So if we define this all one form alpha zero and restrict it on the odd dimensional sphere, then it's a contact form. And you guys can check for yourselves that alpha zero wedge d alpha zero to the n minus one is a volume form for the sphere, so it doesn't vanish anywhere. And the kernel of this is the is what we like to call the standard contact structure on the sphere. And sort of a trivial example, but we'll be using it throughout the rest of the slides are S3 and R4 and C2, is, um, and you can define it as a level set of this function. And so the standard contact form is going to be given by this. Um, it's sort of tricky, but we'll use it later. So now that we know what contact manifolds are, let's try to define when they're similar. So two contact manifolds are said to be contact dimorphic if there's a diffeomorphism from one to the other such that the push forward of one contact structure is the same thing as the contact structure on the second one. And we can define this, we can define contact amorphisms with contact forms. So if the first contact structure is the kernel of some form alpha one, and the second one is the kernel of some form alpha two, then we say they are contact amorphic if the pullback but the second form is G times the first form. And why does this make sense? It makes sense because the kernel of G times alpha one is, same, is the same thing as the kernel of alpha one if G is strictly positive. And when, when we have, and this leads us to the conclusion that the contact structure of the kernel of alpha one and the contact structure of G alpha one are the same. So let's look at an, at an example. R3 with the kernel of the one form we showed earlier, and R3 with the kernel of this form are contact amorphic. And in fact, these are something we like to call strictly contact amorphic, which means that not only are the contact structures the same, but these two contact forms are also the same. So when we have uh, morphisms like contact amorphisms, obviously one thing we study are invariants in their contact amorphisms. However, there's something that's not invariant, which is very important to what uh, our project is. And these are called rep vector fields. So given a contact form alpha and a contact structure, the kernel of this alpha, then the rep vector field is the unique vector field determined by these two equations. And the first equation is a normalization requirement. And the second one is a transversality requirement, which says that the red vector field is transverse to the contact structure. So when we have vector fields, the natural thing to do is flow along these vector fields. So we call the red flow just the usual integral along the vector field that we know and love. So now that we have this, it's, you might have realized that it's very important which form we have. And what I mean by that is the red flow is not the same of, al of some form alpha is not the same as the rate flow of G alpha. Even though G alpha and alpha have the same contact structure, obviously if alpha of R equals one, G alpha of R is not gonna be equal to one. So we, have, we can have two contact manifolds which have the same contact structure but wildly different uh, rate dynamics because rate flow is dependent on our choice of alpha. So now let's give an example. Um, so this is the alpha zero that I defined earlier. And the red vector field is given by this. And in case you don't believe me, this, uh, you can see that if when alpha zero eats this form, uh, we're gonna have 
the sum of the norms z0 and z1, which on S3 is 1. So alpha of r is going to be equal to 1. So we can solve the differential equation that gives us flow. And here it is. So here's the rate flow. And these are orbits because at every point, you can come back to the same point. And these might look uh, familiar to some of you because the rate orbits on S3 are the hop fibers, which are a uh, topological object that is studied in detail. But we will not uh, mention it in the rest of the talk because that's not what our talk's about. So now I hand the floor to her. Okay. Um, so now that you know general things about contact geometry, we'll talk about the space we're working with. Um, so we're take the finite subgroup SU2 of C that's given by this following matrix. As I'm sure you can see, this is isomorphic <coughs> to Z mod n plus 1 Z. And the Lund space we're considering is S3 mod this gamma. This is called the Lund space L n plus 1 n. Um, this, is a, this is a manifold because our action is free everywhere except for the origin, where it's got a fixed point. And it's a contact manifold because the contact form and contact structure both descend to the quotients. Um, but this is actually a little bit annoying to work with. This quotient is sort of hard to think about. So we're going to have to look, realize this another way as what's called a link of a hypersurface singularity. So you do some algebra, and you can identify the entire um, C2 mod gamma with a hypersurface in C3, you do this by taking some like basis of invariant monomials in C2 mod gamma and uh, doing a change of coordinates and basically giving you mass. Um, and then uh, this also has a singularity at the origin because the derivative doesn't have full rank. And um, this uh, corresponds to the previous fixed point of the origin of the the action. To resolve the singularity, what we do is we take a link, what's called a link, by intersecting with the five sphere. A very primitive example of that is shown in this uh, somewhat crude picture, but you have, a, you have a singular point here, and then to of your like hypersurface there, and you resolve that by sort of intersecting with this, this circle. And, um, this also gets a contact structure by taking the subset of the tangent bundle that's uh, invariant under, uh, under what's basically multiplication by i. And, since, and so now you have these two contact manifolds, and um, lemma to our supervisors it, it is that they're contact homomorphic. So we can look at um, this one when we want to study the previous one. And we are interested in the sort of dynamics of the red vector field on this. And to study that properly, we need to make a non-degenerate form. And to define a non-degenerate form, I have to define a non-degenerate orbit. Um, and that's just an orbit that's isolated. And a non-degenerate form is a form all of whose wave orbits are non-degenerate. Um, so this is a generic property. Um, given a contact form, you can always sort of perturb it to make it non-degenerate. Most contact forms are non-degenerate, but this is not a constructive process. If you want one, you have to make one. And why we care? That's because a lot of the important invariants that I'm going to talk about a little bit later only make sense with uh, non-degenerate ring orbits. And unfortunately, the standard contact form on the sphere is degenerate because, as you saw earlier, there's a periodic orbit at each since in both cases L sort of gets its contact structure from S3 or S5 in some sense, it's also, they're also degenerate, the, the standard forms you get. Um, so what did we do? We determined a non-degenerate form that looks like this. Um, we basically generalized a method of Ustilovsky who did this for a different class of manifolds and um, by sort of taking an existing form and then um, adding in some a small irrational number that sort of like perturbs it, so you only get um, 
three periodic orbits. And um, so now that we, and this is actually contactomorphic to the standard form it gets from S5, hence also the form it gets from S3. So, so all of our, the stuff we do here can sort of translate. So now we now what we haven't done but will hopefully complete soon is getting some important product compared for L. The first thing is something called the Conley Zander index for each rate orbit. Um, that's a dynamical index for the orbit that um, that's just an integer. Um, you need isolated orbits because if you don't, then this thing isn't invariant in your homotopy. And once we get this, we can hopefully get what's called the contact homology of L. Um, this, this, this most similar thing to this that you've maybe seen is Morse, Morse homology. Um, but instead of critical points, you talk about, um, instead of critical points, you have rate orbits. And so, and like from like, instead of like paths, you have what are called pseudo holometric curves. And it's, you go from like a rave orbit to a rave orbit whose index is, whose Conley Zander index is like too lower or something. And so what we want is our Conley Zander indexes to be all even or all odd or something, because then the like boundary map is trivial. Um, and then contact homology is not generally well defined, because you kind of have, you have two problems. You have to get a contact homology that makes sense, and you have to prove that it sort of, that this is invariant under, um, kind of under contactomorphisms, even when you go back to a, to a, um, to like a degenerate form or something. And um, I'm pretty sure this is, this, this thing is well defined for three, for three manifolds, but not, we're not sure about beyond, and a lot of people are sort of working on uh, sort of fixing this theory of contact homology. And, um, including our supervisor and also, I think, uh, Helmut Hofer at the IAS. And um, thank you for listening. Uh, we'd like to thank um, the MathRU program for making this possible. We'd like to thank our supervisors, Joe Nelson and Ron Castellano. And we'd also like, like to thank um, Jing Yu Gao and uh, Saraswati Mekatesh for also sort of helping us out. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Well, can you, you, you mentioned that the, this form that you came up with was a special, was an adaptation of another technique for producing analogous forms on other links. Is that, is that what's going on? Yes. Um, so, what do you think like a mean sequence explanation of this procedure? Okay. Um, so basically, the idea is that um, you have some, in our cases, like the rate flows are like e to the to to the i something, similar to on the sphere, and um, these you have some coefficients, but like like with the sphere, these um, you can just you can just take a, a period. Um, and like, you'll always have a period. So um, what you do is you kind of insert these small little like rationally independent epsilons, so you don't get a period in common. Yeah, we add one to one of them, and then we subtract the epsilon from the other. So these are obviously not rational. Any more questions? Um, thank you.